Thank you, Tim, for praying this morning for us. And please follow along with me as we read from Psalm 23, and the scripture will be on the screen for you to follow along. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Are you dwelling in the house of the Lord today? Do you know the shepherd as your shepherd? Are you following him? Today we continue in this Psalm 23 as we continue to look to living in the light of a shepherd, as we continue to look to fearless living. Psalm 23 is a psalm which many of us have memorized or many of us have memorized as children, and many of us, we know this psalm. In fact, so much of the world, they know this psalm. Even if they're not followers of Christ, they know these words especially that part where it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. We hear it in our movies. We hear it in our songs on the radio. We know this, but so very few of times do we actually think to apply it to our lives. Too often we only think of this psalm in days of peril, days of crisis, days of destruction. Too often do we only think of this psalm at funerals in world pandemics, in worldly issues, instead of in our everyday. And I believe that this Psalm 23, just like all of God's Word, is to be used in our everydays and not just in our some days. You see, Psalm 23 teaches us that we have a shepherd, and a shepherd leads his sheep. A shepherd provides all their needs. A shepherd provides for them still waters and green pastures. But for us, as God's sheep, as God's children, he provides so much more. You see, Jesus starts a great restoration in our lives. He creates a great restoration for our souls and leads us in his ways, ways and paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Do you dwell in the house of the Lord? Do you need a great restoration in your life? Or maybe... Maybe you think of somebody in your life that you know which needs a great restoration. Maybe you think of somebody now who persecutes you, hurts you, is killing you in a sense every day, and they need to know the name of Christ. They need this great shepherd in their lives. I ask you today to pray on their behalf. I ask you also to pray for yourself, pray for this great restoration of your soul. You see, King David in this Psalm 23, he knew more than anybody what it meant to shepherd. He used to be a shepherd of of a flock of sheep, and now he's a shepherd of God's people as a king looking over a kingdom. But I I believe as we look to this verse 3 and we camp out here and we see, he restores my soul, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, David's looking back upon his life and reflecting of how God has restored his soul. Even though he is a sinful individual, even though he has committed great wrongdoings, David, a man after God's own heart, has committed great wrongdoings, adultery and lustful thoughts and actions, murdering one of his own people. Who knows what else he had done? And yet, He reflects upon his life, and he reflects that he still has a shepherd who provides for all of his needs and restores his soul and leads them in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. You see, many other biblical heroes that we look to also have restored souls, and they have a past. They're ordinary men used for extraordinary purposes by God. We see Moses. We see Abraham. We see all the disciples of Christ who had their shortcomings, and yet Christ restored their souls. We see people like the Apostle Paul, who tortured Christians, killed Christians, arrested Christians, 
And yet, in 1 Timothy 1.13, he says, Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. You see, Paul did not know God. He thought he knew God. He knew all of God's words. He knew God's laws in the book, but he didn't truly know God. But once he came to truly know Christ, and once he truly accepted Christ and follow after Christ, he, he began to understand. He had the spirit within him to make sense of what was happening all around him. And God would use him. God would give him a great restored soul, a restoration, and use him for mighty works. You see, we all need restoration. We're all people like Paul. We're all people like David. We're all people like the disciples who have passed and have problems and have wrongdoings, but God gives us a great restoration, and he wants to use you. He wants to use your friends. He wants to use your family. He wants to use your enemies. He wants to use all of us. But we need first a great restoration and to walk along the paths of righteousness, which only the great shepherd can bring us to for his name's sake. You see, without a great restoration in our life, our life kind of looks like this slide behind me, this picture. My title slide for today, it might look familiar to you. It's similar to what we've seen every week, fearless living, but it's in black and white. You see, that's kind of how our lives are without a great shepherd, without Christ in our life. We see the world in black and white. Everything looks fuzzy, We might have a little bit of color in our life, but it's hard to read. It's hard to understand. It's hard to focus on. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says, The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. But you see, when we accept Christ as our Lord, as our Savior, we now have the Spirit within our life, and we can understand things in a new light. That's when it changes to fearless living in color. You can now see the world as God intended you to see. You can now see the mountains, the hills, the waters, the green pastures in high definition, in full color, in ultra high definition. You now have an understanding which goes beyond your own understanding because now you can understand things the way that God intended you to. You have been restored. And in 1 Corinthians 2.12, it says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. John 14.26 further goes on and says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you remembrance of all that I have said unto you. If you remember the disciples speaking after Jesus' death, they, they all of a sudden start understanding what had happened and what Jesus was trying to tell them. And even more after the Holy Spirit came upon them, you see testimonies of now they fully understand what was happening through the cross, through Jesus' life, through Jesus' death, through Jesus' resurrection. Maybe you think in your own life, you think of some people, and you think, just why can't they understand what I have and why they need it? It's because they're not following the Spirit's conviction. Or maybe because you're trying to convict them when really you need to pray for the Spirit to do the convicting. All you can do is deliver the good news, but the Spirit is the one that truly convicts. Jesus is truly the good news, not you. The message of the gospel, the message of the cross. Listen to one more verse here found in Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, which says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your path. Isn't that a great scripture to think of as we think of today's scripture? Psalm 23, verse 3, the great restoration. He says, He restores my soul, and he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Think of that song we sang. I know it was a new song. You didn't know very well, at least. But it said, Graves into gardens. The lyrics read, 
I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and you put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Through Jesus, we have a great restoration of our souls and we have a new path of living. We have new paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I want you to see that through Christ's sacrifice and following him as your shepherd, you have a great restoration. Through this news of the gospel of Christ, the gospel of the cross, everybody in your life does have an opportunity at restoration. Sometimes we need to make a point to follow him and deliver that news. All the time, we need to make the point to follow the news ourselves of restoration. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. All who trust in the Lord Jesus as Savior can have restored lives. All who trust in him can be seen as righteous because of him, because of Jesus, and for him, for Jesus. As that song reminds you, Jesus puts your life back together again, and every desire is now satisfied. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. As I thought about this thought of restoration this week, I thought about my past days working in automotive service departments and all the different people I would meet. You see, I met some people who would restore classic automobiles, sports cars, muscle cars. For you truck guys, yes, they even restored some trucks sometimes, maybe in some old vans. And there's one thing I found with these classic automotive restoration guys. You had your hobbyist and you had your professionalist. I don't know if that's a word, but I just said it, professionalist. You had your guys who would restore classic cars as a hobby and for fun, and you'd have your guys who would do it as a professional business. And sometimes, not all the times, you could tell a difference between the guys who were classic restoration experts and the guys who were amateurs. Not all the time. Sometimes the hobbyists did wonderful jobs. But sometimes you see that the classic guys, like the, the experts, like this friend I had, this man I knew by the name of Steve Glazier, he could spend over a year, he could spend years on one single vehicle. And not because he wasn't good, but because he was such an expert. He wanted it to be like new. Look at this picture that I'm going to show up on screen. Isn't this amazing? This is a car that he did, Steve Glazier, on the left to the right. And what amazes me is the before and after transformation, this great transformation of an automobile. That the one on the left, that picture, in its original state, it looks like a car that is just worthless. It looks like an automobile which should just be sent to a junkyard. It's undesirable, and the only thing it's worthy of is, an, is a car crusher. And yet the owner of this vehicle and this great restoration expert, they can see beyond what everybody else sees. They can see what it truly is meant to be. They can see what it can turn into. They can see a like new, great restored vehicle, a restored life. You see, Jesus is the same way for us. Just as a great restoration expert can see what it can become, Jesus sees what we are meant to be and what we can become. Jesus knows that our lives need restored, but more than that, he knows that our souls need restored. We are flawed and this world is flawed and we're living in flawed vehicles, just like this vehicle was flawed, but he was able to nearly perfect it and make it new. Now, Steve, if you're watching, please follow along. I'm not trying to say it's not perfect, but please follow along here. You see, only the Savior can truly make us new. And here's what I mean. Even a classic automobile expert, a restoration expert, 
might make little mistakes, which to the naked eye, to anybody else, they, they look at that and they think, wow, that is amazing. But the expert who did the restoration, he looks at that car and he remembers little spots which maybe he wish, hmm, I wish this would have turned out just a little bit better. Or maybe he looks back at the past and he sees the left and he thinks of what it used to be. Well, when Christ restores us, we're not made like new, we're made truly new. Our sins are in our past, and God says our sins are as far as are the east from the west. He forgets our sins. They're behind him, and he looks on to the future and what he wants us to be now. Christ restores our soul, and he leads us on paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We're better than any restored automobile because a restored automobile is always like new because it's not truly new. But we are truly new. We are new creations in his name for his name's sake. I think this for his name's sake means two different things. You see, for one thing, it's because of his name that we are made new. It's because of his name. It's because of his righteousness laid down, sacrificed for us through the cross, and now we are seen as new. We are made righteous because of him. But then also this for his name's sake is because we're supposed to be now exalting him, glorifying him, living for him, for his name's sake with these new restored souls. So I think of this classic restored automobile, and I've got the name of it, the year of it in my office. I'm not even going to try because I'll probably get wrong. Somebody make fun of me. But this isn't meant to just be put in a garage, people. This classic automobile, now they may not want to drive it either and put a ton of miles on it, but they're normally at least going to haul it to a car show on a trailer, in a trailer to protect the paint job, and they're going to show it off. For his name's sake. We have restored souls. We're called to live in his righteousness, by the path of righteousness, for his name's sake. This brings me to some steps, and we'll talk more about that living in the path of righteousness. Step one, some points for you. Step one for the great restoration for a life is this. Accept the great restoration expert into the life. You need to accept the Savior. You need to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. He is the great restoration expert that you need. He restores your soul. Step two. Step two is this. Allow him to grind away at your rusty spots to make you new. Step two. Allow the great restoration expert to grind away at anything that needs removed from your life. The worldliness needs to go. Now, some restoration experts and some of you watching right now, you might be kind of cringing at the word grind away. And I like that grind away word because it does make you kind of cringe. And you think, oh, man, you're right. I, I do need to grind it away at. God like a chisel. When I think of a skit guy's video of a chisel, he chisels away at you. He takes away, he rubs off, he, he takes away anything that's not supposed to be there. Years of effect of, of, of living in a sinful world, and he makes you more like Christ. He leads you in paths of righteousness. But you see, great automotive restoration experts like Steve Glazier, they probably don't like that word grind away because they don't want to grind away. They want to try to keep the automobile as original as possible. Hey, what would, I, what would I see in your faces if, if you heard all that woodwork on that car is real wood? Look at it in the, in the restored version. Isn't that beautiful? That is restored wood. Guys, think about your cars now. Do you drive in cars made out of wood? No. Maybe you have a little bit of wood inlays, but it's hard to restore that wood. God can restore anything. God can restore any soul, any life. No matter how bad you think your life is, no matter what you think you've done, no matter what you think this enemy of yours is, and you're probably picturing somebody in your life right now who you just can't even stand being around. You cringe just at the thought of them. 
God can restore that soul. You can tell a professional restoration expert apart from an amateur in that an amateur, myself included, you see, I used to dream of owning a classic car. And I always said, I wanted, the, I wanted to get the body, get a car that the body work was already done. So I just need to work on the engine work. Well, partially, because that makes it look good. People can't tell when you drive down the road that it needs restored. It needs work. A professional restoration expert. He doesn't just work on the outside. He works on the inside. He grinds away and cleans up and replaces the inner workings just as much as the external workings so that it is truly like new. Jesus restores your soul. Step three, accept the inner workings of Christ and not just the outer workings of Christ. Allow the great restoration of expert of Christ to work on your insides not just your outsides. What is he trying to tell you to change? What is he trying to tell you to let go of, to let him remove from your life? Give it up. Verse three continues on with the thought of restoration with saying that he leads me in paths of righteousness. Colossians 2.6 says, as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk with him. You see, as a restored soul individual, you're now set on a new course. You have new roads to drive on if you want to continue with this illustration of the car. You need to drive with him in the driver's seat. You need to allow him to lead you on the roads that he says are good for you. You know, if you've got that brand new restored car, you're probably not going to want to drive it down all the roads with potholes everywhere, mud mud-filled holes everywhere. You're going to want to try and keep it on clean, smooth streets. God wants you driving along the path of righteousness too for his name's sake. So step four is with your restored soul, drive it home, drive it to the glory of God. Step four again, with your restored soul, drive it home. Drive it to the glory of God. And when I say drive it home, I'm not meaning to drive it into your garage and hide it. No, I'm meaning drive it with eternal kingdom, eternal living in your mind. Honor God, glorify him, drive with him. You are the passenger. Where is he wanting to lead you? Where is he wanting you to go? Will you follow his guidance? Will you drive on the paths of righteousness for his name's sake? Will you focus on the eternal kingdom and live in these paths? Will you live eternal living based on the hope and the peace that he gives to your life? You see, Christ Jesus is Lord and Savior of your life isn't just Lord and Savior. He's shepherding you and he wants to guide you. He wants to redirect every step of yours to lead you in paths of righteousness. We're still gonna make mistakes And that's why I say this great restoration effort that Christ does for you, it's an everyday thing. He doesn't just restore you at the moment of salvation. He continues to restore you each and every single day. He continues to sanctify you each day by making you more like him. And let me tell you this, Christ Jesus as shepherd of your life, as Lord of your life, as savior of your life, he never gives up on you. Just like that classic car. Looks like it's undesirable and like it should just be given up on, thrown away. You might think of that as yourself. But the great restoration expert sees what it should be. Christ sees what your life should be and what it could be and what it can be. But you need to accept the great restoration that he can give to you. Follow the shepherd as Lord and Savior. Follow Jesus Walk in the path of righteousness, which he leads you to for his name's sake, because of his workings on the cross and for his name's sake, glorify him with your life. Finally, brothers and sisters, I end with one scripture and one thought. Second Corinthians 13, 11 tells us, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive for full restoration 
Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. That's the scripture. Here's the thought. I've been reading a book on the gospel of the cross with my staff, with my office manager, Jessica Bovey here, and I've shared with some of you some of the thoughts of this, these pages. And this week, he had a great statement. This whole chapter was about living, looking to the gospel of the cross daily. And this author, C.J. Mahaney, I believe it is, he says that every single day, living and looking to the gospel of the cross, you should be praying it, you should be singing it, you should be studying it, and you should be reviewing how the gospel of the cross has changed your life. Let's pray and let's focus on the great restoration, the great restored soul, the path of righteousness that he leads you upon now for his name's sake. Let's close in prayer. After prayer, we're gonna be taking communion together. There'll be a little one minute video intermission. So please don't turn off the stream yet. That little one minute video is there for you if you need to go grab your juice, your cup, your bread, your crackers and prepare. But let's close in prayer first. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the great restoration experts of our life. And Lord, you don't just make us like new. You make us truly new. You have restored our souls and we have a new understanding of your word and your will and the world around us. We now see not just in black and white, but in full color. Lord, thank you for leading us along the path of righteousness for your name's sake. And Lord, we just pray today, may we reflect upon our lives, but may we most importantly reflect upon your life your great sacrifice that you made for us so that we can truly live in hope, in peace, in light of a shepherd. Amen. Thank you. 